I V M. Folks, welcome to Paisa Paisa. I'm your host Anupam Gupta, B50 on Twitter, and my guest today is among the oldest wealth management firms globally. I'll be talking with Ashish Gumashta of Julius Bear India, and we will be talking about everything from outlook for markets, what's happening in wealth management, trends, asset classes, all of that. Right after this short break. Inflation, fiscal deficit. जीडीपी एम एस पी एन पी एक्विटी मार्केट वगैरह वगैरह दोस्तों हमने सारे शब्द टीवी या अखबार में जरूर देखे होंगे या फिर सुने होंगे पर हम में से कितने लोग हैं जो ये जानते हैं कि इन सब का सीधा प्रभाव पड़ता है हमारी सैलरी पर हमारे इंक्रीमेंट पर और कम वक्त हमारे खर्चों पर दोस्तों मेरा नाम है अभिनव त्रिवेदी और मैं बात कर रहा हूँ इक्का दुक्का इकोनॉमी पॉडकास्ट से जहाँ पे इस तरह के इकोनॉमिक और फाइनेंशियल टर्म्स को मैं जोड़ूंगा सीधा आपकी जेब से हर मंगलवार एक नया एपिसोड सुने आई पॉडकास्ट की वेबसाइट ऐप या फिर किसी भी अन्य पॉडकास्ट प्लेटफॉर्म आरोप and welcome back ashish welcome to paisa paisa thank you so much for doing this for our listeners thank you anupam it's a honor for me to be on this show and uh, to be hosted by you so thank you so much for inviting me very kind of you thank you so much so let's start tell us about julius bear globally and then julius bear india i mean you know uh, globally of course i don't know whether i've got the pronunciation right because i'm pretty sure in german it sounds a little bit different but tell us about julius bear globally and its presence in india so uh, anupam julius bear is one of the oldest uh, private banks uh, in the world and uh, in the global space of private banking there's something called pure private banking uh, what pure private banking means is you have no conflict of interest you're only representing the customer so it's one of the world's largest pure private banks uh, the history goes back to uh, 130 years and uh, subsequently uh, uh, most of our shareholders are institutions pension funds and i'm given to understand that uh, it's over the longest history of dividend paying so our basic uh, focus is on private banking uh, internationally and locally and as you are aware now the world is getting wealthier the kind of money which is got printed so we are uh, present across uh, almost uh, 25 plus countries and india is one of the top 5 focus markets of julius bear so that's uh, a very quick uh, perspective on the international side uh, in india julius bear operates in uh, seven cities and uh, we are in all the metros plus we are looking for expanding uh, across india our primary focus is on uh, like i said on private banking uh, globally we manage about 500 billion dollars of assets and uh, the whole uh, whole idea is that in this complex world of wealth how can you simplify things and how can uh, if you really see there are only three asset classes you have debt you have equity and you have alternatives how can you allocate a- assets properly and how best can you manage that for your client so that's yeah, broadly what julius bear is trying to do and just for our listeners to understand you know because out here in india the concept of private banking is a little bit different like you know you've got banks and then within that you've got banking service to say hnis and family offices which is called private banking whereas i think globally it has a different connotation so if you could just tell us give us an idea of the kind of clients that you service maybe that might be helpful for our listeners no uh, thank you for asking this question because uh, i think wealth management is uh, one of the most misunderstood uh, terms uh, across the world so uh, there are three things uh, which we are trying to do uh, the first thing is manage wealth for the high net worth and the ultra high net worth and broadly uh, Uh, it is a million dollar plus category you know so which is 7 to 10 crores plus so uh, that's our primary focus as you are aware uh, indians uh, uh, there's been a significant amount of wealth creation which has happened in india so across industries across businesses lot of wealth creation has happened uh, we have the tech industry we have the pharma industry indian businesses have gone global and uh, within uh, indians today you have global family so most families you will come across will have one part of the family living overseas somebody living in india Uh, we think this global private banking is a big opportunity where families are living across borders they have wealth here they have wealth internationally so our uh, primary focus what we are trying to do is manage wealth uh, for the high net worth and the ultra high net worth that is uh, what we uh, really try and do uh, this uh, comprises of uh, three segments a uh, first is managing money for them uh, as you are aware in india all resident indians uh, can only invest in india and you can take 250000 dollars overseas so the first part is managing wealth for you in india and if you are looking at diversifying then uh, investing for you overseas uh, the second part is uh, anything to do with the business so we have multiple tie ups in terms of trust structuring 
uh, lending. Uh, we have a NBFC, uh, which lends money. We have investment banking tie-up. So any other financial related uh, challenges, you know, which a family faces, uh, we try and work around it, you know. So this, uh, if you really simply put it in uh, in the jargon, is called uh, pure private banking. And uh, uh, the licenses in India that you need for it is uh, basically, uh, you have to have the licenses for advisory, and you should have all the licenses for execution. You know? So that's uh, simply put wealth management. Yeah, we've had a few wealth management firms on Pesa Pesa. We've had um, Entrust, okay. we have okay. had uh, Validus, and we have had Waterfield 3 that I can remember. Okay. So it's great to have one of the oldest players um, globally out here. So Ashish, let's talk about wealth management. You know, you just spoke about how in the last few years that bracket has increased, that cohort or whatever they call it these days have increased. How have the HNIs, ultra HNIs, family offices been doing um, broadly in the last four or five years when, of course, this big bump up has happened? And any key trends that you see in this area in these very volatile, I would say, six months or maybe, you know, since the equity market stopped out in October of last year, any trends that we can talk about about your clientele? So um, you mentioned the three uh, houses that you have interviewed, you know, so in a way, we do a combination of all what the three of them do, you know, so it's, uh, uh, it's an end to end uh, kind of a proposition. Uh, so Indian uh, high net worth or ultra high net worth has evolved uh, very, very significantly. So there are three key events, uh, which has happened in India. Uh, number one, we've become global. So a lot of international players have come in and invested in Indian businesses. So Indian promoters have formed JVs partnerships, they have sold businesses, that has been the first source of uh, wealth creation uh, uh, in India. Uh, the second big uh, source of wealth creation has been uh, asset prices which have gone up. So real estate prices which have gone up, et cetera, et cetera. That's been the uh, second uh, big uh, source of wealth creation. And third big source of wealth creation has been professionals. You know, So you suddenly have CEOs, CXOs, uh, the kind of wealth tech industry has created. Now, all this combined makes India a very, very uh, interesting proposition. Uh, if you remember in the 90s, we had a very high tax rate. We had a very simple tax regime. But that has changed uh, with uh, dividend laws changing, tax creating. And people have realized that financialization of wealth is very important because the biggest advantage that uh, private banking or wealth management really offers you is liquidity. You know, And a, a wealth management player, like to give you an anecdotal example, uh, I would say 80 to 90% uh, of our assets a client can raise cash within 72 hours you know so uh, what private banking industry offers you is liquidity and that is what promoters have realized so in my view there's major financialization of uh, wealth which is happening and which used to be unorganized is getting organized so i think uh, this industry has just seen its early days and uh, uh, it's got a great uh, future ahead uh, people are understanding what is professional wealth management and as we go along i can talk to you more in detail uh, what families have been doing or what is it uh, how are they thinking about it you know but uh, broadly uh, the shift is unorganized to organized uh, significant wealth coming in and people now wanting to seek uh, professional help in managing rather than having the traditional uh, family accountant i mean or the trusted advisor managing money they want to professionalize that service yeah i, I can understand that because this probably was supposed to be in the domain of say main street banks right because the bank is the most basic financial product. And if I'm someone who's working for a large bank and I see that my client has got a sudden influx of money, I would probably, you know, offer him or her some kind of service. But obviously, this is specialized, which is why you've got very large, significant book, probably an I, a Kotak, and the three, you know, that I, I mentioned, Entrust, Validus, Waterfield, and then, of course, there's Julius Bell. So let's talk about that. You know, what are the services that make this area of wealth management so, I don't know, precise? Something that needs to be personalized to their clients. So uh, if you uh, really ask me, the business is very simple, but to keep things simple in life uh, is not easy. And uh, uh, I think the expertise of a global firm lies in uh, trying to place, uh, trying to simplify things uh, for people. You know, So uh, what we really try and do is uh, achieve three things for a client. You know, First is make sure you get the asset allocation right. Now, uh, it sounds very simple. But uh, human behavior is, uh, you know, we are homo sapiens, right? So we are uh, trained to react to uh, information and uh, typically uh, we do the opposite of what we are supposed to do. You know, so uh, uh, like, uh, like as we go and talk about products, you know, very often uh, things are very simple, but we don't try to simplify things. So the first key thing, which as wealth managers we try and achieve is make sure that we are able to convince the client on the right asset allocation. What is it that you should be in debt? When is it that you should be in equity? When is it that you should be in alternative, which is the right mix which you have to take 
when is it, if you are taking too much risk in your business then you have got to be conservative on your portfolio if you are taking too much uh, if your business is doing well and it's uh, doing well then so the first key thing which we try and do is uh, asset allocation the second thing is family's objectives keep changing over a period of time you know so how do you keep the family aligned how do you take everybody together how do you make sure that you are able to uh, take the family around and actually uh, anupam it's a very boring business because you deal with three generations of people you meet the same client it's not like an investment banking that you have a new deal or a new business right so uh, you've got to keep sticking to it you've got to keep doing the right thing you know so the second thing is uh, are you disciplined and very often uh, i tell relationship managers it's not how many things you get right but how many mistakes you cut at some point of time so when you are doing 10 things and if you do two things wrong you've got to make sure that you correct that mistake quickly you know so the second part is following the discipline of this asset allocation implementing it for your thing and the third is doing the same thing consistently and making sure that you make your client's life operationally easy because today there's an information flood most of these clients are traveling they have work they have jobs so i mean this is the science which we try and do and uh, how do you simplify it or uh, you use technology to really do that but with a personal touch so uh, you will be surprised but it's one of the most personalized uh, businesses uh, uh, which is here and uh, while technology is there we still believe that relationship managers and advisors play, play a very critical role so uh, the average tenure of our advisor would be 10 to 15 years so it takes a lot of time oh, to build this wow. business yeah it takes a lot of time to build trust and uh, uh, we would be managing uh, you know uh, at, uh, we don't give country specific figures but uh, we are the largest uh, uh, foreign player in the country so uh, on an average every uh, the average size of the relationship is 10 to 15 million dollars plus at the same time it first slice the tagline that we as a firm use is big enough to small enough to get wow i love I, i aside from the ticket size of course which is very specific to wealth management i really like the two three things that you said simplicity asset allocation consistency because all of that actually applies to all of us in our own financial plans irrespective of whatever our um, you know that our net worth is or corpus is i believe asset allocation has a fairly large role to play in longer term returns of the portfolio right that's right that's right so for example if you see large caps today i mean uh, the largest you've seen the largest bank has announced a merger and if you see uh, the stock is down 30 35% you know so if you look at anecdotally sometimes simple things in life would do the right things and uh, uh, in the last 3 uh, months you had such a significant correction in the large caps uh, within yeah. telecom the largest player is down 30% so i mean like i told you that if you are able to allocate correctly uh, make sure that we can get the right product mix i think that makes a big difference but the art in that is lies in convincing the client that like this is a year of preservation as we go along products uh, we'll talk about it but this is a year of preservation you had two years of great returns this is a year you've got to try and preserve so let's talk about that let's talk top down what are the kind of assets or investments that you recommend to your client i'm pretty sure that equities is obviously one part of it but what are the other especially alternate assets that you re- recommend to your clients right so uh, globally this trend uh, started about uh, 10 15 years ago but alternatives now is a very very big asset class so just to uh, i know you have a very sophisticated group of listeners but just to again uh, simplify life for them in the world you can only invest money in three asset classes you can be in equity you can be in fixed income or you can be in alternatives on alternatives includes real estate commodities and i'll share some of my personal views on real estate when we come you know on how yeah. we uh, see it uh, within equities you can have uh, uh, listed and unlisted within debt you know you can have across asset classes and then you have alternatives as an asset class now in india alternatives was always a personal way of investing uh, you have a family friend who's starting a business you would go and invest in him uh some cousin of yours is starting a business you would go and invest in him. so alternative investing as an asset class always existed in india it's come in a structured form uh, in the last couple of years and uh, the alternative asset class again uh, has a huge opportunity the challenge uh, again anupam is that the investor should educate himself in this asset classes because very often what happens when you invest in the alternative asset class there's a asset liability mismatch your tenure of investing and your tenure of exiting uh that uh, happens a challenge so i i'll go into the details of that so uh, when we talk of alternatives in india in the fixed income space we have now invits and reits uh, which have come in investment trusts have come in and uh, real estate investment trusts have come in i think uh, the real estate market is getting organized and there's a huge opportunity here this is a great fixed income product uh, uh, which is available uh, to our clients 
but it's very important that the clients understand that there are mark to market risk uh, opportunities here these are real estate assets which in turn invest in rentals and rentals agreements are done for 5 10 year period so when you are in the alternative uh, asset class in my view you should take a longer term approach to investing rather than a short uh, equities listed equities offer you the biggest advantage of liquidity within 24 hours or within 48 hours the money comes to you same happens with debt but when you are in the alternative asset class i think you have to marry the risk return uh, time frame so the spaces which we are looking at is within equities we have private equity funds we have venture capital funds uh, esg is a new emerging theme uh, uh, which i think will grow uh, in the coming years within fixed income you have investment trusts you have real estate trusts uh, which are really coming in and and i see commodity funds uh, real estate funds again coming in this space so if you really ask me uh, alternatives in india was an unorganized uh, space but uh, it will get organized over a period of time uh, alternatives had seen uh, very inflated valuations i think uh, that is something which will correct and every client should have alternatives uh, as an asset class uh, in india we don't re- recommend crypto uh, but in switzerland uh, we are invested in ziba bank which is a Uh, government promoted the crypto bank and we tell clients that they should have 1 to 2% of their assets in crypto again so alternatives as an asset class should be a part of your portfolio but jaise uh, aap when you make food dal you you know you put masala so it should the uh-huh. it should be the form of a masala or a joga it should not become majority part of your portfolio so uh-huh. right now uh, we recommend 8 to 10% in alternatives as an asset class of the for a standard portfolio of course there are we have private equity investors who have 70% in alternative asset classes for but for a general client uh, uh, broadly we are between 45 and 50% equity 40 to 45% debt and the balance in alternatives you know that's the way yeah. we are seeing the space but it will be a very exci- exciting space i think there's a big opportunity there in it yeah, yeah so just before we go into a break ashish i want to ask you this one question because the last couple of years has seen and i use the word that i hear often democratization of this alternate mm-hmm. asset space for you know people of the retail class whereas the alternate mm-hmm. assets that you're talking about okay other than reits and invits because those are also available to the retail yeah. investor also but if i look at startup investing okay if i look at private debt okay a lot of startups have come up in this space saying that we can offer you the same services that wealth managers give to hnis and we can give that to you as part of democratization of the space their logic right. being that what separates you know what they do from us whereas you are giving your service to a client who's got a portfolio of 10 crores these guys are probably giving it to someone who has a portfolio of i don't know 1 lakh maybe what do you think about this new you know it's still very small but it gets a lot of noise lot of publicity on social media you know they'll take private debt where um you could own an asset or you can lease an asset or um in real estate you could even you know you have certain structures out there any views on that uh, so i think that's the beauty of what technology has done and i think that's the greatest gift of technology uh, but the challenge that i see is uh, invariably the retail investor uh, lands up losing uh, money because uh, if you see the world of private equity or unlisted typically the best deals go to the biggest players then uh, if they refuse then you go to the next then you go to the next then you go to the next so my uh, advice uh, to the retail investor would be that uh, we have a great regulator uh, he has done tremendous uh, service to us in terms of regulations uh, in terms of fee structures you know uh, I, i feel we have the most progressive uh, bank i mean when i talk to my colleagues in zurich they have very high regard for uh, reserve bank of india i think we have a great regulator and please do simple things uh, so what really worries me is uh, when i watch ipl and the ads which come you know there it's all quick money just transact anywhere actually investing is a very boring business the lesser you do the more money you make you know like uh, Uh, since i'm a wealth manager it's i've been 28 years with julius fair uh, the way i test myself is that uh, i should be able to create wealth for myself right and i would not even be spending half a percent of my time on my own portfolio but on a post tax basis i think that compounds more than my salary income yes. from julius fair you know? so my advice to the retail investor would be to keep things simple not to get uh, carried away 
and uh, we have a great regulator we have great uh, institutions like mutual funds which have got formed uh, and to stick to that you know but uh, as time evolves uh, more instruments will be available more tools will be available uh, what what a retail investor or what any investor has to understand that in the startup world the casualty rate is 95 to 99% you know so when you're building your wealth you don't want to you know have that level of casualty right i mean it is uh, i would say not like lottery buying but it is the highest degree of risk which you can take so when you have reached a certain stage of wealth you say okay that's the reason i said even today when we deal with ultra high net worths we tell them that look look at 5 or 10% because if you get this right uh, the delta is very higher so my uh, i'm not qualified i'm not capable but with my gray hair of 52 years of age my advice to the retail investor would be keep things simple we have a great regulator we have democratized things and stick to simple listed products where uh, there is oversight you know that that's my current uh, having said it i think we are in some uh, we are in some headwinds right now so in the current time itself i would say uh, it would make sense to be uh, cautious but great. as we go along i'm sure uh, regu- rules will evolve regulations will evolve uh, private equity opportunities will be available to uh, investors you know so uh, i would treat this with a great deal of caution anupam my my suggestion yeah. would be to treat this with a, lo- a lot of caution there you go folks valuable advice treat with a lot of caution keep things simple look at the listed space and we've got a great regulator who will take care of your interest for a regular so on that note we'll take a break and we'll be right back on this really special episode of paisa paisa hello 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 everybody it's been an other awesome great week on the ibm podcast network On Cyrus says Cock and Bull, Cyrus Naveen Anirudh and Antarish discuss how Snoop Dogg gave his personal blunt roller a pay hike because of inflation. On Simplified, Chuck and Shrika take a look at Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg's legacy. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam talks to Vijay Mantri. He is the co-founder and chief investment strategy at JRL Money. They debunk the myth of active versus passive investing. On the Life Manifesto, Zarina teaches us the value of a good leader through the story The Emperor's New Clothes. And on Smarter with Sid, Siddharth explains how power dressing works. We got some exciting news for you. IBM Podcast has just launched its merch line and you should check it out now. Head over to the IBM Podcast website, that's ibmpodcast.com, and click on the shop tab to check out our first collection of t-shirts. Also, do follow us on social media. We're IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. That really does help. Don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you're listening to us on and also do remember you can check out a number of our shows on YouTube. You can go to ibmpodcast.com/youtube to get a list of the channels that we are keeping active. We also are doing a small listener survey. If you could go to ibmpodcast.com/survey to fill this out, it'll just take a few minutes and it really helps us out. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, SBI Life Insurance, apne liye, apno ke liye. Jupiter a digital banking app cap gemini get the future you want intel v pro built for business and intel future banana wonderful with intel powered laptops and welcome back folks to this episode of paisa paisa my guest ashish kumarsta julius bear ashish on this second part of the episode let's talk about outlook across the asset classes that julius bear recommends to its clients in india and let's start with equity markets you gave some you know some mention about how large caps have fallen significantly so let's talk about in depth your outlook for equity markets in india so um, i'll try and simplify things you know so that uh, while we have a very very intelligent audience which is very smart but i'll try and uh, put things in simple perspective so we have three or four key trends uh, which are across the world and questions which each one of us are asking and i'll talk to you a bit about this correction which has happened so the first is inflation right and uh, it is here to stay uh, we've had low interest rates a lot of money has got printed countries have printed money and it's in the system so whether it will be inflation stagflation is what uh, we will all question and debate but the fact is that this is the first thing uh, which is here to stay and in such a scenario equities is the best bet Uh, you know an equities and probably real estate is the best bet so i think uh, as an at- asset class that's the first thing uh, which we've got to look at the second thing is that uh, the us dollar has had its supremacy for a very long period of time uh, but uh, i think there is a 
effort you know to find alternatives to that by uh, investors globally uh, the recent uh, swift court freezing uh, in the case of the uh, russian crisis so i think uh, uh, people are looking at alternatives uh, alternative currencies and india portrays a great uh, picture to the world you know uh, we are a stable uh, democracy uh, we have robust systems we have capital markets we have good reserves so i think uh, the second key trend is uh that the world is looking at globalizing uh they are looking at uh, alternatives to china they are looking at alternatives and i think that's the uh, uh, opportunity for us you know so that again uh, the easiest way to capture uh, that is uh, and, and you've seen government do a series of reforms pli uh, uh the production linked incentive scheme uh, uh, we've had a host of corporate tax today is uh, probably the lowest uh, uh, in the world so Uh, with all these things i think uh, we will be a, a destination to uh, attract capital you know the the third part is with the supply chain mismatches and uh, especially oil i think uh, that is a part which we uh, really need to uh, watch out for so when you take uh, uh, equities in in the big picture uh, the si- the situation looks positive uh, at the same time there are a series of headwinds so the first thing we as investors have to do is moderate our expectations from uh, the equity markets so uh, the second thing is uh, we've got to uh, understand the big picture i think we've crossed uh, the threshold our gdp has crossed 300 3 trillion you know and uh, we've seen like uh, anupam if you go to a hotel today it's difficult to find a table if you go to the airline uh, you don't get a ticket so i think as an economy uh, we have arrived you know and rather than looking at too much information or too much data i think this agri prices which have gone up will benefit the rural economy so the sum and substance is that uh, what is happening in the world i think is going to uh, benefit us uh, uh, as a country so uh, in terms of uh, geopolitics uh, in terms of supply chain uh, in terms of uh, our positioning um, uh, uh, as a uh, favored in, in destination i think a lot of the picture uh, falls into uh, place uh, for us you know so Uh, if i'm an investor uh, i would still uh, be overweight equity having said it the next 3 to 6 months what's going to happen neither i know nor i mean you know maybe the most powerful guys in the world would also not know because uh, you have a uh, russia ukraine war you re- keep reading about taiwan china so i think whenever these kind of crises come up these are opportunities to invest you know so my two simple bits to the uh, investor would be the day you think things are worse the day you feel you know and and that's the way i personally you trade myself that whenever i feel very low or things are going wrong that is a time to invest in equity so i think the coming uh, few months will uh, uh, give us a good opportunity uh, to look at equity uh, so just to summarize china plus one pli i think uh, with this crisis the world will outsource more and more uh, to india uh, we've done our banks are now in a much better position uh, than where we are uh, whatever reforms we've done we've done rera we've done x y z i think all that will come in uh, we are politically strong uh, the ruling party seems to be doing well uh, we have an election in 2 years and politically we look like a stable situation so i think keeping net net uh, all this in mind uh, we would be positive long term uh, equity and short term uh, cautious because of all these global factors uh, anything can happen uh, stocks can correct so use these opportunities to uh, build an asset allocation my advice to the clients would be and and if you have long term money whatever money you have 3 to 5 years i think 40 to 60 40 to 50% one can look at in equity sure let's talk about the debt market in this environment of rising rates rising inflation or at least high inflation what's your view there yeah so anupam you would have read about the modern uh, monetary theory right where uh, governments uh, will allow capitalism but uh, they will control capitalism you know so uh, across the world you have inflation which is coming in but the governments uh, want to keep interest rates under control because the the general view which is coming is that this is a supply chain mismatch this is due to extenuating factors and by raising interest rates you will actually kill demand and you will not achieve anything so it's a very very tough time um, uh, for a private banker or a wealth manager like julius bear or anybody to give you a view on this but uh, what common sense shows me that today government bonds itself are trading close to 6 to 7% you know so if you are in 3 to 5 year maturity i think our 10 year has crossed 7% you know i mean uh, logically my advice to the investor would be be very cautious stay in triple a assets and be in the 3 to 5 year uh, maturity uh, if you are a sophisticated investor and you have access and you have understanding of uh, credit markets then of course credit markets uh, give you a 2 to 300 400% higher return but 
to the investor who doesn't want stress, who doesn't want tension, I mean, my advice would be uh, interest rates now look interesting. Uh, we don't know where uh, it would go. But it's very clearly that uh, inflation is here to stay. It is going to have an impact with us. At the same time, governments recognize that if interest go too much, it could be detrimental to the economy. You know? So broadly, uh, three to five year maturity, uh, be conservative, uh, you know, and uh, don't invest where you don't understand, like, you know, is my advice you know, to the investor. Yeah. And coming into some place where a lot of people don't understand real estate. And that, that's a fairly big All chunk right. of HNI investment, right? So what's your view there? Because real estate um, on the residential side, of course, people say that, you know, that there's rental yield is 2%, home loans are at 7%, so forget it. So if you, let's not look at that part, but the advice that you give on real estate as an asset, you know, to the fairly large yeah. chunk of HNI investment, what's your view out there? Okay. So I'll break it into two parts. Uh, first is as Julius Bear, and then my personal, because, you know, we don't cover this entire spectrum. So uh, I would caution investors that part of it, my personal opinion, please don't take it seriously. I'm not that smart. You know, I'm a professional working in the company for 28 years. So take it with a pinch of salt and use your own judgment. So as a sector, we have positive on real estate. We think it's an asset class uh, uh, one should be in. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, again, common sense approach. All the data is out in public. Look at what the government is rolling out in PLI, the kind of manufacturing which is getting set up. Now, all this is going to need housing space, et cetera, et cetera, here. You know, if you just, if someone just drills down on the kind of capex which is coming in, the kind of PLI investment which is coming into India, that itself will show you the scale of opportunity which is coming in. The second is the IT sector. The whole world is going to outsource to India. As global companies cut costs, again, that outsourcing is going to come to India. But uh, this time, it's going to be different. It's not going to come to the top two or two, three cities where you have 30, 40, 50, 60,000 rupees a square feet rent, you know, because people have realized that if you're in a Coimbatore, you can work as well as you can work in Bangalore, you know. So, or if you're in, uh, you know, uh, maybe outskirts of Pune, uh, it is better than being in Pune. So I think uh, as an asset class, uh, real estate uh, in India, should do well. But again, uh, one should expect moderate returns. What has happened, Anupam, in real estate is that a lot of investors have got out. See, we have GST and then we have stamp duty. That combined is 11%. So a lot of investors and with lower rental yield. So actually, it's a, the market has uh, become quite transparent with only users coming in. You know, And uh, if you know that real estate is a great hedge for inflation. So what has happened in the last couple of months is that input costs have gone up very, very sharply for real estate companies. Steel has gone up, cement has gone up, uh, etc. And uh, I think that will have a bit of an impact. But just before I get into it, uh, what, what we've seen are real estate, ultra high net worths do in real estate. So we've seen them buy a lot of land. So lo they bought a lot of land. Uh, we've seen uh, ultra high net worths buy uh, high net worths by uh, second homes. And we've seen everybody upgrade their lifestyle. So a two bedroom guy wants to go into a three bedroom, a three bedroom guy wants to go into a four bedroom. So I think all this will lead to a lot of uh, investment-led uh, demand in real estate. Two cities where a lot of premium have got paid, which is Bombay and Pune, we'll have to be a cautious. If you see public data, most state governments now, Anupam, will raise money by selling FSI or selling premium rights, etc., because it's the easiest way. Uh, the whole Chinese economy grew on uh, every state or cantonment selling uh, real estate. You know, So I think Bombay and Pune may see some ex excessive supply. But Bangalore, Chennai, NCR, I think uh, these are very, very uh, interesting place. So uh, sum and substance, uh, it's an asset class you should be in. Having said it, uh, registrations and all have fallen this month. You know? So there may be a bit of correction. These are my personal views. Please take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, we do look at real estate, but through uh, asset managers. So we give money to fund managers, asset managers who in turn have uh, real estate products. You know, So I think asset class, uh, we, are, uh, we are positive. You know? And uh, uh, more and more transparency is coming into the industry. Consolidation of wealth is coming into it. Uh, for the equity market investors, uh, one of the ways of uh, taking advantage of that is buying ancillaries, the tile suppliers, you know, those who supply to real. So while real, you can buy real estate companies, but their cycle is very long. But the suppliers, the ancillary suppliers to the real estate, uh, uh, our research is in fact recommending the ancillary suppliers to the real estate industry. You know? So that that's broadly... Uh, uh, you know, part of Julius Bear and part of my personal opinion on uh, sure, real sure. estate. Ajay, let's wind up this episode with the alternatives as a category and within that 
probably you know a fairly hot area in india for the last couple of years investment opportunities outside of india what's what's julius bear's views on that right so uh, in alternatives uh, i think uh, gold and silver still continue to be a hedge uh, against currency so with so much print money getting printed uh, uh, with so much uh, of uh, you know of uh, capital uh, uh, being uh, uh, every country has gone and printed i think uh, as an insurance uh, one can still look at gold and silver uh, in india we don't uh, recommend crypto uh, we don't advise clients but globally uh, we are saying that look buy a basket of 1 to 2% depending uh, on their comfort you know and uh, uh, alternatives uh, as an asset class should definitely uh, form a part of your portfolio uh, you should look at invits you should look at reits uh, you should look at private equity funds but please have a 5 to 10 year outlook on it and please spend some time understanding this space because uh, this is a space which is evolving whenever something is new uh, you have to spend time like on nfts i still spend time reading about it you know i mean so uh, i think this is an asset class here to stay uh, like i said globally we are telling clients to have this as up to 10% in their portfolio depending on their risk appetite but uh, uh, again please don't borrow money to put in this asset class is my personal advice and secondly have a longer term outlook when you get into this asset class because uh, uh, we may have some challenges uh, uh, in terms of in the, the the headwinds are there you know so i mean th- that's my outlook going to your last question on international investing uh, we've seen that uh, uh, for resident indians there is a liberalized remittance scheme and uh, the outflows for that uh, the investments through that are growing up every year uh, i think uh, it offers a great diversification opportunity for indians uh, overseas and uh, we should definitely be looking at uh, every family uh, should look at uh, uh, diversifying overseas uh, through these uh, uh, opportunities again uh, keep your life simple uh, understand the product which you are getting into please don't forget the world has only three or four asset classes you know so uh, please don't do something which is very very sophisticated but the world but the world gives you a very simple opportunity like you have businesses uh, you have great businesses uh, which are available there now at good valuation so even as julius bear we brought in two of our global funds into india so they are available uh, through the wrapper we've taken a wrapper of birla mutual fund and under that uh, we have two of our best global uh, products which are available uh, and i think it is an asset class which should definitely form a, a part of your portfolio 5 10 15% because uh, again depending on your net worth and the size of, of uh, portfolio uh, my advice would not to you would not to be doing contra investing like uh, just because china has corrected you invest in it you invest in it at the right time you know when the economy is doing well the cycle turns so i think the world uh, gives a good space uh, uh sir available at fairly good valuations internationally and i think uh, uh, we'll have a plethora of products coming there again please be cautious uh, in what you're doing the indian mutual fund industry again offers you that option so try and keep uh, things simple yeah so just on that note since we are closing now if you could just tell our listeners a specific julius bear product that you're offering through aditya billa sun life i think you're talking about the global excellence uh, fund of funds so or what is yeah that's right. because that's i right. think those those are products where the retail investor can actually invest in your products via the fund of fund so what are those products that's right so we have two funds we have the next generation fund uh, these are businesses of the future the best of uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies the tech companies great uh, equipment manufacturers medical facilities and then the global excellence fund which offer you some of the best global businesses now a lot of innovation happens outside india and these businesses and companies we don't have access to but uh, as i understand anupam that uh, there is an rpi limit permission which is required overall for the mutual fund industry so uh, to the best of my knowledge that has not come but the not moment that comes yet, both, yeah. both these so the, so one is called the next generation fund the second is called the global excellence fund and both these funds we think uh, are great opportunities uh, most of these businesses replicas don't exist in india so you are actually generally uh, diversifying your wealth again uh, like i said the next couple of months there are headwinds so please invest cautiously please invest systematically and uh, uh, too much of reading or too much of don't every day check the nav because when you buy a real estate you forget your house for 5 years and that's when you see appreciation in the capital markets the problem is you buy today and then next day you start seeing your nav you know so uh, mm-hmm. and of course please do consult a financial advisor uh, julius bear would be a great place to come and take advice from but uh, Uh, that that's broadly my views on it yeah folks so remember consult your financial advisor
these are slightly evolved products the global excellence equity fund or the next generation these are fund of funds they have a tax impact consult your financial advisor before taking any investment decision and on that note of very very good advice i would say from ashish that is a wrap on this episode of paisa paisa my guest ashish kumarsta of julius bear india ashish really thank you so much for doing this for our listeners Thank you, Anupam. I'm very grateful that you gave us an opportunity to come and speak to your listener. Thank you very much. Please come by again. You're always welcome on Pesa Pesa. And folks, thank you for listening to this episode of Pesa Pesa. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM Network. You can listen to us on the IBM Podcast app or ibmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are IBM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm your host Anupam Gupta, B50 on Twitter. And thank you, folks. Really, thank you so much for listening to Pesa Pesa. No material on the show should be considered as financial advice. The material on the show is for informational purposes only. Please consult a financial advisor before taking any investment decision. Have you ever wondered where the business world is headed? How the ways in which we create, market and sell to consumers will evolve or if we'll ever go back to wearing pants while working? For answers to all of this and more, tune into Advertising is Dead with me, Varun Dugirala. Every Tuesday, as I talk to entrepreneurs, leaders and change makers from across business, media, marketing and beyond, you can catch all episodes of Advertising is Dead on the IBM Podcast website, app or wherever you get your podcasts from. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey where you can fill out the survey.